Chapter 1. The Necessity of Pre-Evangelism Before Tom Terrence assumed the role of president of the C.S. Lewis Institute, he co-pastored a multiracial church in ethnically diverse Washington, D.C. Before that, he was a seminary student. Before that, he blew up buildings, or at least he tried to. He particularly targeted the properties of Jews and blacks, the groups he hated most, although Roman Catholics were high on that list as well. That's why he joined the Ku Klux Klan. This partly explains how he landed in a state penitentiary. He escaped, got recaptured, was sent back to solitary confinement, and in that same prison, in a six-foot-by-nine-foot windowless prison cell, became a Christian. As you might guess, I've left out a few details of his story, which is told rivetingly in his book, Consumed by Hate, Redeemed by Love. An aspect of the story I find intriguing is that before he came to faith, he read books on philosophy. For months, he worked through weighty philosophical works by the likes of Hegel, Plato, Aristotle, and the Stoics. It was as if he needed his thinking about truth in general rewired before exploring the specific truth of the gospel. It was through reading a book on political philosophy that he began questioning his views about race. He came to see he was wrong about something he felt so right about, the inferiority of some races to others. Realigning his thinking about truth paved the way for him to submit to the truth. Not everyone needs to read Plato before Paul, but some do. Joy Davidman, who later became C.S. Lewis's wife, had to have her thinking about communist doctrine debunked before she could entertain another doctrine, the Christian one. She also had to realize that she believed in science the way religious people believed in God. The painful events of World War II exposed flaws in Marxism and atheism that opened her up to consider theism. She admitted that her previously held beliefs were hopeless and naive. Both Tom and Joy encountered what many call pre-evangelism, a preparation for receiving the gospel. This preparation can take a much wider variety of forms than we see in those first two examples, so don't be put off if they seem a little highbrow. Most people need a less academic version, challenges to their lifestyles or morality, perhaps. But I am convinced that for our current context, pre-evangelism may be the most important and least valued strategy for fruitful evangelism. I also believe it is the most important lesson we can learn from C.S. Lewis. That's why I put this chapter first. Paving the Way you may be resistant to this idea. You may be thinking, can't we just preach the simple gospel and let God do the rest? I understand the concern for not compromising the gospel, but consider that Jesus and Paul both modeled pre-evangelism before expounding the specifics of the cross and resurrection. To the woman at the well, Jesus spent a fair amount of time talking about water and thirst, appealing first to her desires. He spoke about a thirst that could not be satisfied through relationships. In her case, it was seen in five failed marriages and a current cohabitation with a similarly doomed prospect. Sometimes we need to point out to people that they've fashioned broken cisterns that can't hold water. See Jeremiah 2 verse 13. Before we offer living water. With the Stoic and Epicurean philosophers on Mars Hill in Athens, Paul gave a lot of attention to the nature of knowledge and what it means to be human, appealing to their intellect. His speech explored what people can know about God through general revelation. He urged his listeners to consider people's efforts to reach beyond themselves, their objects of worship, Acts 17, 23, and to recall what their poets had already expressed, the idea that we are his offspring, verse 28. Paul's flow of logic in Romans 1 and 2 echoes the same progression. We see God's general revelation in nature, Romans 1, 20, and in our consciences, 2, 15, before the clear statement of the gospel in the scriptures, 3, 21 through 26. Sometimes the setup is as important as the delivery. 
In John Stott's insightful commentary on Paul's methodology, he pointed out, the Areopagus, Mars Hill, address reveals the comprehensiveness of Paul's message. He proclaimed God in his fullness as creator, sustainer, ruler, father, and judge. Now, all this is part of the gospel, or at least, it is the indispensable background to the gospel, without which the gospel cannot effectively be preached. Many people are rejecting our gospel today, not because they perceive it to be false, but because they perceive it to be trivial. People are looking for an integrated worldview which makes sense of all their experience. We learned from Paul that we cannot preach the gospel of Jesus without the doctrine of God, or the cross without the creation, or salvation without judgment. I hope you'll see by now what I mean when I say pre-evangelism and evangelism. By evangelism, I mean a very precise, rather narrow task, the verbal proclamation of the gospel message. This message is that God has a kingdom, and we can become citizens of that kingdom, all because of Jesus' death and resurrection. I'll say a great deal more about this message and how we can proclaim it clearly in chapter 5. By pre-evangelism, I mean a wide array of conversations and actions that pave the way and build plausibility for understanding and reception of the gospel. Jesus' conversation about thirst, Paul's quotation from a Greek poet, the breakdown of Tom Terence's prejudices with the help of books on philosophy, all these are pre-evangelism.